we got a, a good one here. This this sort of ties in with what we've been trying to do as we do these uh, these events on an annual basis, trying to do some personal wellness stuff. So um, from my perspective, there's uh, no one I respect more from that perspective, uh, given that he's uh, been my fitness coach uh, for a while and, and given me some programs that have really helped change my life with two herniated discs. Um, uh, it's been a really uh, great last six or seven years, thanks to Jonathan's program. So Jonathan Ross is on with us. Jonathan's a multiple personal trainer of the year award winner, uh, brain fitness expert, which Jonathan, I want to ask you about at the end of the, the uh, program as well. Uh, blogger for the American Council on Exercise and a master trainer as well. Also an author, Abs Revealed, really cool book. Uh, and Jonathan travels all over the world talking fitness and fun and keeping it fun. Uh, and his... Uh, his tagline is fun tensity. So Jonathan, we're going to hand it over to you and let you, uh, let you run with it, man. Good to see you. Likewise. Thank you, Mark. And greetings, PGA professionals and associates. Now today is going to be a very personal, even though I haven't met every single one of you, we're going to cover a lot of topics in fitness and nutrition, pretty rapid fire because Mark gave me a uh, responses to a helpful survey that we put together to send out because I wanted to make this as personal as possible. And here's what I want you to do to get the most out of this today, just to give us a sense of how you can make this most effective for your life. If you're using pen and paper, then you can draw what would look like a bullseye with three circles in it. So there's a smaller one in the middle and, a, and then a bigger one and then one outside that. If you're not using pen and paper, you can just do that mentally. So what you'll do with that is, as we go through everything we'll talk about, you'll figure out what goes in the center of that bullseye. It's the most important thing that you hear today, that you hear it and you go, bing, bing, it just makes your own little personal light bulb go off. Or it maybe makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And just like, that's really relevant for me. And then the thing that's, that, that's in the second circle outside of that would be maybe the second place in that category. And then there's an opportunity to write one in the third outer ring as well, but that's up to you. Just pick at least one or two. You can do it on paper or just mentally, but it's good if you write it down somewhere eventually. Start with those things because a lot of times with fitness and nutrition, we fall into an all or nothing pattern. And if we do one thing wrong, we feel like we have to stop until all the conditions are right. And this, this goes into many different aspects of fitness. It's not helpful because it's not reality. In that it, if you're practicing your golf swing and you go to hit 100 balls and your plan is to hit 100 balls, is it worthless if you only hit 99 balls and stop before you hit that last ball? No, there's some benefit to the practice and the repetition that you got ahead of that. It's all sort of on a spectrum and fitness and nutrition are the exact same way. And I want to share with, with you very quickly that I come from an unhealthy household. My father was over 400 pounds when he died in 1995. I was 24 years old, didn't know what I wanted to do for a living, and that helped me figure it out, which is this. So I come from a background which, which hasn't really been based in fitness, so I know what it's like to make changes. I grew up eating a lot of unhealthy food. Uh, fortunately, I was playing a lot, running around outside, so I had that going for me, but I didn't have a good diet pattern. This hasn't always been easy for me either, so I'm more like you than you probably think. So here's what we're going to do with the whole day. We're going to have an approach where we're going to talk about some of the physical things that you would want to be concerned about, and then we'll shift to nutrition. Along the way, if you have a particularly relevant question, you can drop it into the question box or the chat area, and the host will grab it. And if it's particularly relevant, they may interject and ask it right away. I'm fine with they do that if it seems particularly relevant in that moment, or we can hold it till the end. And we're going to do the physical stuff first, and then we'll talk about nutrition. Now, I have some notes from the responses for the survey that we have, so I can really personalize this. And one thing that jumped out at me is that you're on your feet 20 to 30 or more hours per week. And that was 20 of the 21 respondents. So that's 95% of the people that we got to respond to this survey. Now, what that says to me is that one of the most important things about fitness is posture. And you're going, wait a minute, posture is just when I'm not moving. How is that relevant? Well, if you're on your feet a lot, the position you put your body in when you're not moving is actually very relevant because it's your it's your body's balance or lack thereof between different body parts. 
For example, if I stand like this for 20 or 30 or more hours a day, I'm not gonna feel great at the end of the day. So all you have to do is think about posture as realigning your body parts with gravity. And the way you can do this to practice is a little simple. You don't have to do it right now. If you want to, you can go find a wall, put your heels against the wall, your butt cheeks against the wall, your shoulder blades against the wall. That's not your actual shoulders out here. That's just your scapula, the shoulder blade. And then the hard part for most people is to put your the back of your head against the wall without doing this. So I put this little pole here so I can try to line myself up somewhat vertically to give you a 90 degree perspective on this. Most people will have a little bit of this happening and I'm exaggerating a bit and a little bit of this happening. And it's not your fault. It's really the way we have society. We have keyboards and cell phones and steering wheels and we're all out here all the time. So that if you can just take 30 seconds as you start your day to practice, to get your posture realigned, your butt and heels against the wall, your shoulder blades against the wall, and then sliding your head backwards. So up close, what that looks like, it's this. It's almost like a chicken doing that. You want to pull the chin back. And if uh, you struggle with that, many people do. What I find is the most common compensation that I see is I'll ask someone to slide their head back and they do this because it's the only way they can get the head back to the wall. So if that's tight back here, you can, you can massage it just with your hands more easily. You can even just take a stretch after you massage it put two fingers on your chin. You can do this while you're driving, while you're doing some of your admin work or really any time of day, just push, push your head back. It's not gonna look very attractive. You're trying to make a whole lot of chins under here as you push in on your chin. You're keeping your head, your skull horizontal. It's moving front to back. That's a, just a quick tips on what our postural alignment should be. So if we think of that vertical alignment where my, my ear, the little tip of your ear, that little thing in the front, it's called the tragus. This part of your ear is lined up over your shoulders and then your shoulders are over your hip and your hip is kind of over the, the back one third of your foot. That's good alignment. And that's important for you because if you're putting extra strain on your body, because you're standing 30 or more hours a week, because of how, because of how you're standing, you'll have lots of aches and pains. And here's what happens. A lot of times people have the discomfort here and especially in this part of the sh shoulder and neck. If you have ever watched one of those big parades on TVs that they have for the holidays, there's a giant floating float in the air. And if you look at on the ground, there's a bunch of people all the way around it with ropes. And doing this all day, just as one example, is almost like the people out here on the float, they just went and took a break for hours and hours. So now the people back here have to pull extra hard because there's an imbalance in the float and those people are gonna get tired. Now you might think, well, if my muscles get tired, they're just gonna give up. Because if I give you, if I give you a hundred pound log to carry and you're holding it and holding it and sooner or later your muscles get tired, you just drop it. But that's your arms. The interesting thing about posture muscles is that Postural muscles, if they get tired, if they give up like a bicep would, you'll fall over because they have to keep you upright. So what postural muscles do is they go on lockdown. When they get tired, they just get reflexively tight and they don't open and contract any longer. They don't work as hard anymore. They just go on sort of like an electrical fence just gets, wing, they just get turned on and they stay that way. And so for you, if you have some of that postural strain, the key is just practicing the different positions to be in. And of course, it's alleviating some of the strain. Now, how to do that is, is with a little bit of massage. And there's a number of tools. There's these big cane massagers you can get that work really well in the back of the neck. There's a small mini version. I keep this one in the car and I take it to clients. You can grab this and kind of massage all these areas in here. And then we can also stretch those areas. If, you, if you're sitting in a chair right now and you feel a lot of tension in your sh shoulders, this will work better if you do a little bit of massage first. So, so for example, you don't have to have a fancy tool. You can just grab the one hand and just dig around over there. And then you'll sit in, in your chair after you've spent 30 seconds to a minute of digging around because we're chewing the gum before we blow the bubble. Easy way to remember how we use massage and stretching together for improvements in mobility. 
chew the gum, then blow the bubble. So I chew the gum first, that's this part. And then I would hook my hand under a chair and anchor my hand in that chair and then lift up. And I'll turn so you can see a lift up and then I would turn away from that side with my head. That'll create a nice stretch through here. And it works better if we can massage it first. But if you can't, you just need a stretch, just tuck your hand under the chair. So what have we covered so far? A little massage for the back of the neck, a little stretch for the back of the neck to give that some rest. We've covered a little massage for the upper part of the shoulders. This is called the traps or the trapezius muscle if you're into the fancy terms. And then we anchor underneath a chair and we pull into a stretch. Now we're going to go the other way with posture because we, we had a couple people talk about problems with plantar fasciitis. So a couple survey respondents. Now that can be also a problem born of uh, posture, but also muscle imbalance. The way to address it is, and it's unfortunate because it's tendonitis. What tendonitis is, is a chronically inflamed tendon. And the way out is typically like three times as long as the way in. It's like a hiking path where it's level on the way in and then it's a climb to get out because the tissues, tendons take a long time to heal and they only get healing when they have enough blood flow. They only get blood flow when they're moved, but we tend to not move as much when we're in pain. So the, the key with plantar fasciitis is massaging the tissues first. Not oh, I'm not a huge fan of the cold water bottle thing that's very common only because ice sends blood away from the area. Ice is best used if you are just in pain and you cannot tolerate the pain, then use ice. If you can tolerate the pain a little bit, it's better to use either no ice or sometimes warmth because warmth brings blood flow. Blood flow brings the nutrients for healing of tissues. So what we can do is when you get out of bed, if you have plantar fasciitis, before you step foot on the floor, just take 10 seconds and dig around in the arch of your foot with your thumbs or grab your hand and just move your toes like this. So I'm kind of grabbing my toes and just bending them around. What you're doing is you're lightly moving those tissues on the bottom of your foot or we stand up and put our full body weight on them. And the reason that will hurt so much is that the tissues tried to heal overnight and it's become stuck together so it can start the process of healing. And unlike other areas of the body, when we get tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, when we stand up and put weight on it right away, we, we kind of rip those adhesions apart pretty aggressively and it's painful. So if we can do a little bit of prodding around with your thumb in that area or flexing of the toes or both, just maybe 10 seconds each. I know we wake up in the morning, we got to pee, we got to go to the bathroom. So it's not like you're going to spend a lot of time massaging your foot but just try to do a little bit of mobilizing 10 to 20 seconds on the bottom of the foot and it should hurt a little less when you walk. Then of course, having an opportunity to spend a little more time massaging throughout the day will be tremendously beneficial and also just st stretching the calf and also strengthening the shin. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of strength moves in a little bit, but before I get into the strengthening, there's a number of ways to do the massaging on the bottom of your foot. I don't know, you might have a golf ball or two lying around, could use that. And then this is just a massage ball, which is really just a hard rubber lacrosse ball. You can use a tennis ball. Um, there's certain tools you can get that are actually specifically designed for massage. They can be beneficial as well, but you can go low tech and just grab a golf ball. In fact, if you have plantar fasciitis issues and, and you're seated watching this, you could actually go ahead and take care of some of that work right now. Just put the ball on the bottom of your foot and you would roll it front to back, and then you can also do another strategy with massage where you hold the ball still and you drop your toes down. It might not work as well with a golf ball because it might not elevate your foot enough to be able to flex and extend your toes over the ball. So what are we doing? We're massaging to bring blood flow into the tissues because blood flow brings healing. And then we're stretching because we're looking at most often when you get plantar fasciitis, Part of what's going on is there's a tight calf and or a weak shin involved. And the tissues on the bottom of the foot are getting used to grabbing. They're trying to turn into a hand. So those tissues get a little stressed. And this can also be implicated in a lack of hip mobility. Now, this is also going to lead us into golfer's elbow, which 
can also be tied to back pain. And if you're starting to think this sounds like the song we used to sing as a kid, where we say the knee bone connected to the shin bone, the shin bone connected to the ankle bone, you're exactly right. All of our parts are connected. And, and there's a sort of a, a, an effect that can happen much farther away from where the problem is. Now, there was a few people who mentioned having um, pain in the trailing arm and the wrist and the hand. So when you're on your golf swing, the trailing arm has pain in the wrist and the hand. That's probably due to hip mobility on the other side of the body. Golfer's elbow, that's, a, that's an indication that these tissues are overworking. They're being asked to do too much because when, when a muscle gets tired and it starts to give up, because remember, postural muscles won't give up. They'll go on lockdown. Arm muscles will give up. The muscle will stop working and it'll start treating the tendon like a muscle. And then we start having an unhappy tendon. Once we've gotten to the point where we are, we, ha we, we have golfer's elbow, which is medial epicondylitis. Again, if you're in the fancy terms, I'm not usually just throw it out there once for those that like to learn, but you're essentially wanting to massage that as much as you can, right on that tendon, just forward of the bone, whenever you get a chance. And then if this is you, if you're one of the people that does have that pain here, you have golfer's elbow or just some pain on that trailing arm, try to massage that a little bit. And then we're going to do something called a nerve floss. It's just like your tooth flossing, only it doesn't involve a string. So we're gonna massage that area and it might be on your other side. Just pick whatever arm you feel most affected by. And then what you would do, I'll turn sideways so you can see this. You'll put your arm out to the side, almost to shoulder height, but not quite. And then you'll take this head and you'll move it away. Drop this shoulder down. So instead of here, we go down, head away. And then I'll move this arm backwards slightly. And I'm just pointing my fingers by extending the wrist behind me. So what this is doing, this is putting this long nerve on tension, just like I would with floss. And then this movement of the hand is moving the floss back and forth. Now, why is that important? Nerves are, are happy when they are fed with a lot of blood. If you look at anatomy diagrams and you look at a map of the vascular system, if you happen to look at where all the veins and arteries are in your body, and then you look at the nervous system, it actually looks very similar. That's because nerves travel inside of veins and arteries. So they actually travel inside and they're meant to stretch, but they're also meant to be bathed in blood. And when we have areas that are way out on the farthest reaches of our body, like our arms and the end of our legs, and we're irritated, we tend to not use it as much. And tendons and your joints only get blood flow when we move muscle. In other words, the pumping action of muscle sends blood through our joints and tendons so that we only get blood when we move, but we tend to move less because we're irritated. So it makes it harder to heal. Massage is one way to get a little bit of movement in there, but then we're also actually putting that nerve under stretch. So again, the protocol for this would be tilt the head away from that side, drop that shoulder down, put the arm slightly behind you, and then extend the wrist gently. You'll feel a little pulling sensation right through here. This would be a high rep, 10 to 20 reps, one to two times a day after some massage. So there's something I said a little while ago that I wanna get back into, which is that the problem sometimes that we can have in our extremities can be from a lack of mobility. So specifically hip mobility, and we're gonna show you an exercise for that. We're about to do two different exercises. One is going to be more for a general exercise, but the, the, the bigger concept that I want to teach you before that is that if we look at how our body is best equipped, if we think about, if I pick any joint or any structure in my body that has to do with movement, it can either be really good at stability or really good at mobility. It has that kind of a primary function. So if I say stability and mobility are my two options for all my bodily structures, and I just go structure by structure, starting at the foot. The foot is mostly stable. Yes, it moves a little bit, but it's mostly for stability. The ankle moves a lot. So the ankle is mostly for mobility. 
the knee is mostly for stability. It moves a lot only in one direction. It kind of does this. It doesn't twist very well. That's an injury. And it doesn't bend sideways. That's also an injury. So mostly the knee is for stability. And the hip, much like the ankle, moves in a whole bunch of different directions. So our hips are mostly for mobility. Our low back is mostly for stability. Doesn't have a lot of motion. It has a little bit of flexing the spine, extending the spine and rotating, but only a little bit. The middle part of the spine, what's called your thoracic spine, the middle part here to here, that's where a lot of our mobility is supposed to come from. And then as we go up to the scapula, that's mostly stable. It moves a little bit, but it provides a stable platform for us to produce force with our arm. So you're probably noticing the trend is stability, mobility, stability, mobility, stability, mobility, stability, mobility. Now here's what happens in your body. That's a great design because it lets us have alternating priorities as we go up our kinetic chain in our body. But much like if you run out of something, at least in the old days, we don't really do this anymore. But I remember when I was a kid and my mother was cooking something, if she ran out of flour or sugar, again, because we didn't have a healthy lifestyle, so we were eating a lot of flour and sugar, she would send me with a measuring cup and go knock on one of the neighbor's doors, and she would ask me to go borrow a cup of sugar or a cup of flour. That's what your body does. If your hips are supposed to be mobile or your thoracic spine are supposed to be mobile, and there's a reason I'm bringing up those two areas in particular, and they're not, they're going to get their mobility from somewhere else. They're going to borrow it from somewhere else. And most often with the hip and the middle part of your spine, it will look to the neighbors. So your hip, if it doesn't have enough mobility, it goes to the neighbors. It says, hey, low back, I need you to give me a little more mobility. Or knees, I need you to give me a little more mobility. And then we have back pain, but we don't know why. We have knee pain, but we don't know why. Because the knee and the, and the low back are supposed to be stable, but they're forced into mobility. And then if the thoracic spine isn't able to get enough rotation, which is mostly what it does, it also does flexion extension. Most people's limitations are in rotation. And this is especially applicable to the golf swing, where if I don't have enough rotation through the middle part of my spine, I'm going to get it somewhere else. I'm going to generate that power somewhere else. I'm going to put some torque into the low back. I'm going to try to work harder with my arms than I should. And I'm going to splice or cut something or not hit it where I want to because I'm working too hard with extremities and we're going to end up probably with tendonitis or just pain. Now, a lot of times you find these areas of the low back or the knee or the arms or the shoulder where there's pain, but no pathology. And what that means is that it hurts, but you've been to the doctor and we've looked at it and nothing's wrong. Doctor says we've done an x-ray MRI. Can't see any reason why that should hurt. Well, that just means you don't have a medical problem yet. <laughs> If you keep doing that long enough, you will have a medical problem and then pathology occurs and then you can actually get it treated, which is not the optimum state. So if we have a misalignment or a little bit of dysfunction and that's something supposed to be mobile but isn't, and then it suddenly becomes asked to use mobility, it's going to get it from the neighbors and the neighbors get stressed. So I promised you a couple of movements to address these and let's do that. First one we'll do is to address some hip mobility. Now the hip can move in three different directions. You have forward and back, side to side, and you have rotation, okay? So I can rotate, move side to side, and flex and extend the hip, just like I can the shoulder. What we'll do, and I'm only using this for balance. You don't need this necessarily, but you can do it. Uh, we'll focus on just one exercise because I find it, it's often the one most limited to the golf swing. Now, I do have a couple golfer clients. I'm not a golf expert myself. That's your job, but I understand the physical needs of the golf swing enough to be able to address it. And I'm standing over here so you can see there's little lines in the tile. And what I would do here, I would stand on one of the lines and I put all of the weight on my stance leg. So I have all the weight on the leg I'm standing on. I don't have any weight on this leg at all. And what I wanna do is I wanna turn and just lightly tap my toes. And you can follow along by the way, if you wanna try this to see what you have. I'm not putting any weight here. I'm just lightly tapping down so I don't lose my balance. And I'm just working on internal and external rotation of the stance leg. So what's happening here, when I go this way, this leg is getting external rotation because this one's opening away from that side. When I go over here, this is internal rotation. Actually, both legs are internally rotating, but this one's doing it with load because I'm standing on it. I've got body weight on it. 
And the reason you might want to use tile is you can assess the changes and improvements to your range of motion over time. Now, the next movement I want to show you is, okay, so I was going to fall. Next movement I want to show you is a way to do just body weight exercises, because uh, I think this will be one of the last questions that we have to address, and which is uh, no equipment exercise options. And there's, there's so many, but so, so many of them seem boring if we just say squats, lunges, push-ups, glute bridges, maybe crunches, but there's little ways to have a little bit more benefit to you from the movements that we do, but also they can make them a little more interesting. So if you are interested in following along, please do so. If you're not, that's also fine. All you need is just a little bit of room to be able to squat and move your arms. So squatting is essentially sitting in a chair. And the way we do that is sit back and down. I'm just showing you what it's like to sit in a chair. Squats come from your hips first. We make your booty the boss. That's an easy way to remember it. Make your booty the boss. A lot of times when we have knee pain in a, in a squat, it's because people are doing this. They're, they're going knees first, not hips first. So let your booty be the boss of your knees, just like the shoulder is the boss of the elbow and the wrist. So your hip is the boss of your lower extremities. We sit back and down in your hips, and then we have happier knees because we're putting the hips in charge of the movement. So that's how we do a squat in general. Now, the exercise that we're going to do is called a clock squat. It works like this. I go down into a squat and come up and I'll put one arm at 12 and one arm at six. And then I'll go one arm at one and one arm at seven. And then I go two to eight. And then I go three to nine and so forth. And I work all the way around until the other arm is at 12 and six. And then I come all the way back around to where I started from. All right, so let's do this together. Again, if you're interested in participating, please do. If you're not, that's cool too. So we go down and come up, we go to six and 12. And then we go seven and one, two and eight, three and nine, four and 10, 11 and five, 12 and six. And I come back around the same way I just came until we end up at the same start position. There, so I essentially just did 12 reps of squats. I did it in a way that was a little more interesting for the upper body. I gave myself some shoulder mobility. I worked through multiple angles. And I also did a little bit of brain training because I had to keep track of where I was in the clock. I'm thinking of the hours on the clock as I'm moving my arms. So I'm more cognitively engaged. I'm not as bored as I am if I'm just squatting and I'm just sort of in my head, two steps ahead of myself thinking about what I have next to do in my day. Hey, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, I just want to jump in here real quick uh, since you gave us those two exercises. I've got some questions on the board, um, okay. and some of them are relevant to what you covered a little a little while ago. So I thought maybe hit these if you don't mind. Yeah, that's good because that's kind of the end of the physical section anyway. I'm going to okay. transition to nutrition next, so this is a good time to address those. Perfect. And by the way, for everybody, uh, the lacrosse ball stuff under the feet, Jonathan had gave me that seven years ago because I had wicked plantar fasciitis. It was like a knife going into my heel. And I still do it three or four times a week, the same exact thing he taught me. Uh, and it is life-changing to get rid of it. I have not had it knocking on wood right now. Um, yeah. yeah, those so. massage techniques too, they can also become prevention strategies once you get rid of it. If you know you have a chronic pattern of plantar fasciitis, which I do as well because of a knee surgery, I don't have as much extension in my knee so my calf stays tighter. I have every few years, I get a bout of it, but it, even when you don't actively have plantar fasciitis, if you know you're prone to it, massaging the bottom of the foot can help prevent it. Yeah, so anybody ever wants to see those, we can drop down on the floor, bring a lacrosse ball to the next section or chapter meeting. Um, all right, so first off, Harrison Brink asked, would nerve flossing uh, be a good practice for an active warm up before play or practice, Jonathan? Um, yes, it would. Um, don't have a long answer for that one. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, also, uh, Ed asked, uh, does electrical stimulation therapy help with blood flow to specific areas? And is it uh, more or less or equally beneficial to massage slash rolling therapy? Um, yes, it's beneficial uh, because what it's doing, it's giving you an electrically stimulated contraction of the muscle. It's still a contraction of the muscle. So the same rules of physiology apply. I would say it's different than massage because there's no force being applied to the muscle. It's being sent a neurological signal to make it contract. So what it's doing that massage also does for you is increase blood flow. What it's not doing is it's not actually reducing 
adhesions and restrictions between the muscle fibers, which is what massage can do because you're actually mechanically changing the tissue with massage. Cool. We got two more here. That's great. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on using, Owen asked, um, any thoughts on using a foam roller for improving posture? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, the easiest and most effective thing to do without trying to overthink it is to, so let's pretend I have a foam roller here, and this is not the wall, but it's the floor. I just would be on my foam roller here, and I put my arms out to the side. Wherever I'm comfortable, as I go farther towards my head, I'm going to start to get tight at some point through here, and I just stop when it just starts to get tight, and I just let my arms stay on the floor. The reason I have my knees bent, again, it's not a wall sit, so I'm on the floor, and I, and I'm, I hate those exercises. By the way, I never make people do wall sits. I think there's, they're terrible exercises, um, and I'm serious about that. I just I don't think they're a good exercise. Foam roller on the floor, and you have your butt at one end of the roller, your head is on the other end, and you just sit, and you figure out where your limitation is in the shoulder, and just go just, just to the point, not of discomfort, but almost to discomfort. And what, what you'll find is that because if you're on your feet, forward focus, you know, as you're addressing the ball, showing someone something, as you're on your computer doing your admin work, you're here so much. If you spend just five minutes here, you'll feel vastly different. Just a quick posture reset, because what you're doing, you're letting gravity do the work for you of realigning all the different body parts. It's even easier than standing up against the wall because you can stay there longer. And it feels much more, if, effective in terms of rebalancing some of the chronic positions that we get into as we go about our day, because we're just passively there letting gravity do it. And the longer we can stay in that position, the more our tissues adapt to that realign. You said you had one more, Mark? Yeah, sorry, Jonathan, you froze just a, a hair there real quick, but uh, no worries, we got you. Um, Mike Thomas asked, um, how do you feel about percussion, uh, percussion massagers like uh, Theragun for blood flow, or do you prefer more static uh, massaging like a ball roller or the hook? I think they're both great. I mean, they're all, they're all great. They're kind of like, if, if you ask me, what do I think of a knife, a spoon, a spoon or a fork? I'm like, well, it depends on what I'm doing, right? So that certain tools are going to be more effective for eating certain foods. These things are great. Um, I'm, I'm amazed at how much the prices come down in these things. Um, so the, the bigger ones give you a little more bang for the buck in terms of getting into some of the meatier parts of the body, the smaller ones. Um, I just got this a couple weeks ago. It was $20. I mean, it's absurd how, how much the prices come down in these things. Theragun's the big name, but they're absurdly expensive. It's a very good product. I've used them, but they're, they're, they're sort of outside my budget for massage tools, um, but they are a good product. Um, but there's a lot of products now that are actually very good. And, and they're just, it, it's the, the price has just come down so much. And then the first time I saw one was a Theragun. It was in 2018, I think, maybe 2017. And it sounded as loud as a jackhammer. It was $400, but the, they're quieter and they're a lot more cost effective, but they're very valuable. Any of these tools works for certain tissues at certain times. So I think they all have value, but someone can't really afford or doesn't want to get a massage gun, then, then don't let that be an obstacle to just doing some work with a golf ball, tennis ball, or a massage ball. The most important thing is just getting some work done on your tissues when they need it. Jonathan, last one, and then we'll let you get on to your, to the, the nutrition part. Uh, thoughts on inversion tables. Um, it, it's kind of one of those things where if you, if you find value in it, great. Um, the, my only concern is if someone has high blood pressure or, or just be concerned with how fast you get up, but unloading the spine like that can be very beneficial because we, we get up and we're putting our weight in our spine with gravity and spending a minute or two inverted a little bit. You could even lay over top of an ottoman and bring your head down uh, to create a similar effect if you don't have an inversion table. But if you've tried it and you think it has value, I see no reason why you shouldn't use it. And it's, it, it's a great way to unload the spine for a few minutes. Cool. All right, man, you're, you're okay. on your own. Go for it. Let's go to nutrition now. Uh, so that some of the stats to share with you, the difficult meals, as, as reported by the survey respondents, 10 people had a problem with breakfast, seven with lunch and three with dinner. And the big thing is overeating at dinner. And then with lunch and breakfast, it's, it's how to have it be quick and healthy. And so here's what I'm going to 
offer you, I'm going to give you all, all this for attending today. There's a, there's a small recipe book that I sell for a nominal amount on my website. It's going to be my gift to you as part of this presentation. So um, I'll just, I'll either send it in to Mark and the team and they can send it to you or they can give me your email addresses. I'll send it to you and I'll just send you that. There'll, there'll be a couple of things in there that I'll discuss as options that can be very beneficial to you. The key is that overall, we just want to improve how you're eating and make it easy so that easy we've figured out how to do in our society. We haven't really always figured out how to do easy and healthy so that a bowl of cereal and milk, great, boom, you're out the door, but there's not many cereals that are good for you. So the key is to figure out what you like. I'm never going to tell someone to eat something they don't like because it's healthy. I'll never do that ever. But one thing I will say is that sometimes we don't like something the first time, but if we are committed to continuing to try it, before we determine for sure that we don't like it, we might find ourselves liking it. And so that try something three, four times just to make sure you don't like it. Because sometimes your tastes evolve. And as humans, because of there being a lot of poisonous berries when we were hunter gatherers, our default setting for any food we don't recognize is usually no. So it's, but that's more like our DNA tells us to like, mm, I haven't had that before, I don't want to eat it. So in, in, in the interest of making it simple, I want you to think about foods that you like. I also want you to think about throwing out the rules of what breakfast foods are and lunch foods are and dinner. It doesn't matter. You can have a sandwich for breakfast if you're if that's what you feel like and if that's what's healthier for you. But I'll say that, uh, for example, for some breakfast options, you can, you can use um, peanut butter and some apple slices on bread, take that with you. But the bread has to be high quality. It should be sprouted grain bread. And if you don't know what that is, just go to the freezer section of your grocery store. Even Giant has this now. It used to be available in only health food stores, but you're looking for sprouted grain bread, which essentially is bread produced from something that's not flour. Flour is really not the thing we want to eat too much of. A little here and there is okay, but we want to not base our diet on a day-to-day -day basis on that. And the key element there too is that be more concerned with what you do on a daily basis habitually than what happens on any given single day. And this applies to exercise. It applies to nutrition. It applies to almost everything in, in that if you skip a workout or you eat one bad meal, your body doesn't really care. You don't change the next day. You don't eat one bad meal. Whoa, like where'd all that body weight come from the next day? You don't make one workout and all of a sudden you're cover model ready. Your body changes based on your habits. So that the things that you do most often are the things that will determine the kind of body you live in. So just get better habits in terms of what you do most often and don't stress too much about the occasional things. And when it comes to um, having things for breakfast, let's say if you like oatmeal, great, but use plain oatmeal. If you like yogurt, use plain yogurt. Uh, the, the, the thing to do with... Um, probably even with fruit juices, uh, just have water, have yogurt, have things plain and add the actual thing in. Don't buy blueberry flavored yogurt. Buy plain yogurt, put blueberries in it, put actual blueberries in it. Don't buy pomegranate flavored something, put pomegranates in it. Don't buy banana flavored food, just put bananas in it. So buy the plain versions of things and add stuff in it. One of the recipes that you'll see in the book is it, it's going to sound gross and you can just change it if you think it is, but it, it's something I used to use when I was at the peak of kind of doing what you do when I was doing just mostly training sessions. I was working five and a half days a week, eight to 10 training sessions on weekdays and a half day on weekends, including a few fitness classes thrown in. And at one point I used it, it's called the Super Bowl breakfast, really, uh, um, I guess, appropriate for what's happening now. The Super Bowl breakfast is like yogurt, it's oatmeal, there's a bunch of fruit, bananas, and an egg in it. You just, and then put it in, in the microwave. And it, it, it sounds gross. I will admit when I read it, it sounded gross, but I needed something to fill me up for about five, six hours. And it actually isn't bad. If you, and I, I've put raspberries and blueberries and bananas in it. And I haven't used that in a few years. Most recently, I've been enjoying plain yogurt with berries. And sometimes I mix what I put in it with the fruit so it doesn't get boring but I put in raspberries, blueberries, uh, pomegranate or passion fruit, um, sometimes blackberries. I'll also rotate in chia seeds, flax seeds, different kinds of nuts. 
So it actually becomes, and I put some dried coconut in it as well that's not sweetened. So I'm getting a lot of nutritional benefit out of this and it doesn't taste like boring yogurt. And I'm getting multiple servings of fruits and uh, I guess not vegetables there, but nuts in breakfast. Uh, there's going to be a recipe in there you see called uh, protein power balls. Now, these are super easy to make. It takes about maybe an hour for the food processor, but then you have you, you have options you can take with you. And, and when I was at the peak of doing training sessions, when I didn't have time to stop and eat more regularly, I was using these. These were one of my meals every single day. And what they are, they're a bunch of dried ingredients like nuts and some dried fruit, maybe a little bit of honey if you like it a little bit sweet. I tend to not use that as much. And uh, maybe a scoop of greens powder or protein powder if you like it. And you run all that in the food processor. You put all the dry ingredients in. It becomes like a powder. Then you put in your peanut butter, your almond butter, the stickier stuff, and you hit it again in the food processor. Then you roll it into balls and you roll it in sesame seeds or maybe chia seeds. And you take these little balls with you. And there's pictures of all this in the recipe book and, and how to do it as well. And you take two or three of these with you, maybe with an apple or a banana. And there's a good, very satisfying, very filling lunch that's very easy to eat on the go. And that can also work as a breakfast as well, especially if you're in a rush. The key thing is to eat foods you enjoy that you know are healthy and steer as clear as possible some of the processed stuff. Now, one of the other things that came out of the survey was um, lunch prep and meal prep. Some of you do it more than four days a week, and some of you do it less than two days a week. And there's and it's not to say that you can't eat healthier when buying something out. It's just much more difficult to because eating unhealthier is easier. And that's that's just the way things are run because unhealthier foods are more profitable. Companies aren't trying to make us sick and unhealthy. They just like to make more money and there's more money to be made in lower cost junk foods. So that if you, did, if you can devote a little bit of time to beginning to do meal prep, it takes practice. I can tell you as someone who grew up eating a lot of like pop tarts and box foods and, and hamburger helper and stuff, uh, it's taken me a long time, but I'm there now to get good at just being very quick with stuff. I don't even have to follow recipes anymore. It used to take me longer to cook because I would have to follow recipes to the letter and get out the measuring spoons and cups. But I've gotten better because I've been doing it over 20 years now. Everything gets faster with repetition. What do you tell someone who's new at golf and is learning it? They have to practice and it, it's going to take time. But you'll have these little small notices of improvement where you notice yourself getting better along the way. And it's, it's, it's no different with nutrition and exercise. So the the great message of hope that I have for all of you is that because you're all golf pros, means you learn to play golf, you've already got the skills in you to do well with nutrition and exercise, because you've got this ability to stick with something that takes a lot of dedication over time that shows minimal gradual improvements, but you're also coaching other people to do this the same. All you have to do is take the same skills you already have and apply them to this part of your life. And I know it can be a challenge because Sometimes it seems like our, our society doesn't value healthy living and food and exercise as much so that it's not built into the time for it. Um, we, we typically eat late and have a lot of calories in the evening because that's when we celebrate and hang out and socialize. And so some of the construct of our society is built around making it easier for us to engage in unhealthy behaviors. And it does take a certain level of commitment to stick with it, but that's what you already have. So my message of hope to you is again, just apply these things to apply these skills that you already have to the area of health and fitness for yourself. Um, eating less fast food, having less sugar, having less soda and drinks with sugar was a common theme of some of the responses as well. The reason that liquid sugars are such a problem for us is that we're not used to them for all of human history. We didn't really have a lot of liquid sugar coming in. So our calories that we consume are typically in food where they create bulk. And there's a network of nerves all around your stomach. As your stomach expands, when you eat solid foods, those nerves begin to send a signal of fullness to the brain so that when you drink calories, whether it's a coffee drink, which has a shot of espresso, but most of it's not coffee, um, or it's a sweetened beverage or any a soda, because you need a little pick-me-up, liquid calories don't create the same expansion of the stomach. So it doesn't trigger those network of nerves around the stomach to say, hey, I'm consuming food here. Uh, 
take it easy on the food so that it's much, much easier to overconsume calories when we're drinking them in the form of a liquid. And it also happens that a lot of those high sh sugar foods are not great for our health in general. And, and that's one of the big things you can do to get healthier is, of course, drink less sugar, which I know we know that, but the challenge is in how do you do it? So that uh, I'll just give you a quick story from my background. In the early 1990s, I was beginning to get healthier. I was, I was sort of having a personal desire to get healthy. This had nothing to do with a career in fitness. And I grew up drinking a lot of soda. I get big gulps from 7-Eleven uh, and just drink way too much soda. And, and I think I was 23, maybe 22 at the time. And I, I had a job and I was taking lunch to work. And I decided that I needed to drink less soda. I was probably drinking three to four a day. I don't really, don't really know exactly. But I, as I recall, it was three to four a day. I decided that I was only going to allow myself one can, one 12 ounce can of soda a day. I was going to pack it in my cooler for lunch. And that was going to be it. Other than that, I wasn't going to have soda. So that was 1993. It's now 2023, 30 years later. If I was still drinking one soda per day, that wouldn't be good. But at that time, when I was drinking three to four and my taste buds were used to it, having that one a day still let me stay connected with that thing that I enjoyed, even though I knew I needed to have less of it. But if you had come along and said to me, you need to stop drinking all soda now for the rest of your life, I probably would have said, screw you, I'm going to keep drinking soda. Because there's this process that we have to give ourselves um, some kindness as, as we work towards improving. But it is important that we do improve. And the tricky part with your taste buds, I, I, I have such empathy for all of you that struggle with this because I did for the first 20 years or so of my life. And we often have an attitude of, ah, I just let them eat what they want, they're kids. But then what you do, you end up developing a taste for certain foods for 20 years that you then have to stop eating because your body is now an adult and you're and you're processing calories a lot less efficiently. You're not growing anymore, so you don't even really need as many. But what happened with me is that I started to understand that your, your taste buds will change over time. And that when I first started eating healthier, I couldn't tell the difference between a green pepper and a red pepper, but now I actually can. The red pepper is a little bit sweeter. You can actually taste the difference, but there's no way I could have picked up on that difference when I was drinking a lot of soda. And what it's like is that when you go outside and it's bright and it's sunny and you've been outside for a while, whether it's outside playing golf, working in the yard, doing anything outside, you come back inside, what happens to your vision? Everything looks dim and it's sort of washed out. It's this light green. That's what happens with your taste buds. When you go from drinking sugar or highly salty or, or aggressively flavored foods to, to eating healthier foods, it's like this, every, every, everything just tastes dull and kind of boring just like being outside in the bright sunshine, you come back inside, it starts looking dull. Your eyes will adjust in about 20 to 30 seconds. Unfortunately, our taste buds will take a little longer because it has to do with what our brain finds pleasing. So the message is stick with it. Don't give up. It's extremely valuable. And if you, if you start the process of change and you just commit to saying, okay, maybe something with nutrition is, is putting, putting you in the center of the bullseye, pick something specific, of that bullseye I talked about, the worst thing to do to yourself is to say, I need to eat healthier because that's too vague. That's like saying, I want to go on vacation. It doesn't get you anywhere. Or I want to get a college degree. It doesn't get you a degree. You have to have specifics. You have to say, okay, for breakfast, instead of this, because we often focus on what we're going to reduce and get rid of, instead of getting rid of something, it's easier to say, okay, I'm going to take this away, but what, I'm, what am I going to replace it with? I'm going to take my normal bread and replace it with sprouted grain bread. And you know, maybe you even use one slice of each just to get yourself used to it. The way you go about it doesn't matter. The, the point is that over time, you're accumulating change. Because I guess a big message, uh, as far as a takeaway, a conceptual takeaway here, is that your body doesn't change from making significant changes to what you do. Your body will change most effectively from making a small change and repeating it over time and, and accumulating a number of small changes over time. No one can massively transform their physical self in three months, but you can do a lot of work towards that. And that applies to being unhealthy or healthy. We, our body fights big changes. So just take small changes that you accumulate, pick, pick what's in the center of your bullseye, start it today. 
outside of that, maybe start that in a week or two. Once you feel like the new behavior you've adopted in the center of your bullseye is the thing you, that you have as part of your routine and is automatic. Um, there was also a question too about meal timing. I just wanna make sure I address that. And all you have to do, it's a really easy formula, just back up your from your bedtime and say two to three hours before then should be the last time you eat anything. So if you go to bed at 10, you go to bed at 12, you go to bed at eight, whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't care when people go to sleep. I'm not, something that infuriates me about health experts is that everybody has to rise early and crush the day. It's a bunch of nonsense. We all have in us a bunch of different DNA. When we were hunter gatherers, some of us had to stay up to essentially have sentinel duty to keep watch on the tribe. So that the people that have that DNA in them are gonna be more night owls. The people that don't have that DNA are gonna be up early and then fine but they need to go to sleep early. So there's value in, if you can, adjusting your day to your natural body rhythms. As long as you get enough sleep, your body doesn't care when it occurs. So as far as eating, whatever your bedtime is, just back it down two to three hours from that. And that's probably the last time you should eat something. Um, let's see, I wanna just, uh, yeah, I think I covered everything I had written down. I just uh, wanna allow a few minutes here for questions at the end with nutrition, cause I'm sure there's gonna be some. Yeah, Jonathan, there's a couple on the board here. Um, and by the way, for everybody real quick in the chat earlier, if you scroll up, I did put a link to that cane massager. I found one online, just the first one I found and put it on there. If somebody wants to take a look at that thing. I yeah. put a link in the chat for everybody. Um, Jonathan, oh yeah. Really uh, quick, just so you know, this one I have, I've had it for years, it's called the Body Back Buddy, but there's other companies that have copied this exact design. And there's even some that like break apart and then you put them together. So they're a little more portable. This thing is absurdly not portable. But what's nice about this one, there's one that was really popular. It, it was a, kind of the first one. It's called a Theracane. It's like straight. It just comes over. It looks like a very short shepherd's crook or something like that. It doesn't have these two little knobs right here, which I find these to be particularly valuable for neck massage. It goes right in there on either side of the neck muscles. So if, you're, if that's important to you, be sure to look for one that has those two balls right there. Okay, back to your question. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Jonathan. Um, uh, Owen Oss, any thoughts on using creatine monohydrate as supplement for aging golfers who do regular exercise? Um, well, there's there's been some benefits shown recently to creatine for cognitive health. I haven't looked into it a lot. I was just kind of, ooh, I got to put that aside because uh, as you identified earlier, I'm, I've been uh, super into brain fitness for the last decade has been my focus. Um, but if you're doing... If, if you're doing heavier training or essentially too fatigue training, even with light resistance, if you're doing 20, 30 reps and you're sensing a high degree of fatigue in the muscle, then creatine can be beneficial. Essentially, it will give you a more abundant ability of your muscles rocket fuel when you need to produce high amounts of force in a relatively short amount of time. It's not really as relevant and um, beneficial for, for endurance type activities. So it, it would have some potential benefit depending on the kind of fitness training you're doing. Uh, Jonathan, uh, also a question on, on uh, apple cider vinegar water routines. You thought about that? Uh, well, there's some benefit to the sort of the gut health that you get from apple cider vinegar. Um, I wouldn't expect a lot of magic and a dramatic transformation of anything from any one thing that we're doing. So one way to, to, to kind of finely tune your BS detector for nutrition is that someone comes along and says, unless you do this one thing in this one specific way, you can't be healthy. I call BS on that because humans, like we're, we're up to almost 8 billion, right? We, and we're kind of like taking over the earth. Our population has exploded. In the 1980s, we hit 4 billion. We're now at almost 8 billion. So we, we've, we've been quite prolific. And if we were that precious and that fragile that we needed to have this one thing done just the one way, then we wouldn't be here in the numbers that we are. So what I'll say about that is that if you enjoy the apple cider vinegar, that's the key is you gotta enjoy it because I'm not gonna have anybody eat or drink anything they don't enjoy, but we gotta try it enough to make sure we do enjoy it or not. If you enjoy it and you feel that it does have benefit for you, then fantastic. Awesome. Um, real quick, cause we, we, we don't have time to get too deep into it, but maybe this is something we need to have you come back on and do Jonathan, but I did want you, cause Ed made a mention of this too, in the comments. I just wanted you to give everybody briefly, um, um, 
an idea of what you've been doing with the brain fitness and particularly your work on uh, Alzheimer's, because I think it's relevant in a lot of areas, not, not necessarily golf, but maybe, but also just in life in general. Give everybody kind of a sense of what you've been up to. Sure. And then I'll give, uh, I'll close that by making it practical and showing you something you can do, really any of you can do uh, in this regard. So what we're seeing is that um, brain fitness really is multifactorial. It's not just one thing. It's not nutrition. It's not sleep. It's not stress. It's not exercise. It's all of it. But particularly with Alzheimer's, which is just the most common form of dementia, dementia is an up umbrella term, Alzheimer's is the most common form of that. It's about 60 to 70% of cases. And what's happened with our society is that we're outliving our brains. We're getting really good at keeping our bodies alive. We didn't ever live this long as hunter gatherers. Our brains didn't have to live this long. We pretty much needed to just live long enough to raise our kids and make them viable adults. And then we don't need to be around so much anymore beyond imparting some, you know, wisdom of age to them. But what happens is we're now living long enough that we're outliving our brains. And we're finding that Alzheimer's is multifactorial in that there's so many things that influence it. The least, one of the least influential things is genes. All the genes do is it, it increases your chance of getting something if you engage in lifestyle behaviors that promote that disease. So that some of the most impactful things for preventing Alzheimer's and enhancing brain fitness is the kind of things that we do in a healthy, in a healthy and fit lifestyle. The most significant ones in terms of improving brain fitness outcomes are social connection, physical activity, stress management. Doesn't mean no stress. It means having the right kind of stress or and being able to ameliorate and kind of absolve yourself of the physiological response of negative stress. And then proper sleep and, of course, nutrition. So there's some of the most impactful ones. That means we have we have a lot of things we can actually do. And in terms of making it one level close to being more practical, about 10 years ago, I created my Funtensity program, which the whole purpose of it is designed to make challenging exercise fun so it doesn't feel like a chore. And the way we do that is that if I throw something at you, you have to catch it. Or if I point and you have to move that way or that way, or I say an even or an odd number and you have to move that way, it now becomes something where you have to think and then move, think and then move. So when we combine movement with thinking, we actually use our bodies like we did as hunter gatherers because we had to problem solve. And I created a workout program around that where we use reactivity. There's some coordination because you're doing movements that are maybe familiar, like for example, the clock squat we did earlier, it's a familiar movement, the squat, but we did it in an unfamiliar way that caused you to have to track what you were doing. So there's reactivity, coordination, partner interactivity. There's some degree of partner interactivity in that you're either looking at what someone is telling you to do, either visually or verbally, they're giving you verbal commands that are unpredictable. Um, they're calling out a letter as you're moving and you have to say the first word that comes to mind begins with that letter or they're throwing something at you or they're pushing on you and you have to deal with balance. And then the last component is friendly competition. So there's usually one or two exercises where we make it a little bit of a contest in a friendly way. But here's something you can do in a practical way. So again, you can follow along if you want. If you have a ball or anything, you can use a pillow. You could use a dog's chew toy, anything you might have around. So let's use an example again of a squat where I would take an exercise like a squat and I just toss the ball and I catch it. So instead of doing the squat just by itself now, I'm catching and I can toss and catch the ball off to the side. I also will sometimes take a ball, I'll take a tennis ball and use a Sharpie or any kind of marker and write numbers on it. And I'll have someone catch it and just read out the number that they see. So you're doing close in eye hand coordination and then verbally calling out the number. If you want to get more sophisticated with that, you could toss the ball. And you can do this while you're taking a walk, too. You toss the ball around. If it has numbers on it, you can toss it around and add a seven. And then it's a three, ten. You can add the numbers. You're doing a little bit of cognitive training, a little bit of basic math. It's So integrating physical challenge with cognitive challenge is the sweet spot of making a brain that functions better now but also builds it to be more robust in terms of preventing disease later. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that's great, Jonathan. Um, I just, that, that was great. I wanted you to touch on that. So last thing, Jonathan, and before everybody jumps off, we just want to do a quick uh, reminder on the schedule coming up. But Jonathan, before 
uh, we do that. Just let everybody know where they can find you. Sure. You can uh, go to either one of my two websites, aonfitness.com, which is A-I-O-N fitness.com or fontensity.com. Aon Fitness is my kind of everything, all the writing and speaking and one-on-one training and coaching that I do. Uh, that's kind of where people find me. Fontensity is specific for the Fontensity program that I talked about, which was kind of on hold during all of COVID because it's a partner-based program and uh, it's not really what people wanted um, after 2020. So I'm hoping to restart that again soon. But those are the, you can just go to the website. It's got all my social media there and I'm happy to, to, to help out anyone with anything. If you just reach out to me through either one of those two websites, you can find a contact form and shoot me a message and I'll uh, help you out. And I'll be sending you that recipe book as well. So you can have some options for having easily accessible breakfast and lunch options on the go as golf pros. Fantastic. So everybody, just a quick reminder before we uh, say goodbye to Jonathan, uh, we still have room the 6th and 7th next week at the section office for the specialized teaching and coaching. It's going to be in person. Um, we have some folks signed up. Good sign up so far. We'd love to have you down for that. Get you jump started in the specialized program. Um, February 13th, Jennifer Monroe with Personality Matters. It's going to be really interesting on how to read personalities, yours and others. I think it's very helpful for us in our daily jobs, teaching and working at the clubs. Uh, and then that leads us into the teaching and coaching summit, which I hope everybody's signing up for the super meeting. Uh, it's going to be a great few days. Uh, we hope to see everybody there. It's, it's worth the investment. Trust me, uh, for sure. And then after that, we'll, uh, get into the late part of February with Sean Webb and Bernie Najar with, uh, athletic motion and the golf swing. And then we've got a couple more coming up at the end of February and at the beginning of March as well. So we'll keep you posted on those. Those are up on the website too at mapga.com. All right. Mark, just one quick note there towards the end. Someone, I think Steve asked whether or not we record these. Are they able to go back to these? I mean, Jonathan put a lot of great information out there for you that I think some of us it needs to sit down and listen to again. And that's what Steve's comment was. Can I listen to this again? And yes, Christine does put this on our YouTube page at Mid-Atlantic PGA. Uh, so you can go back and uh, watch these at a later date if you'd like. Perfect. Uh, Jonathan. Thanks so much, man. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, we really appreciate all the knowledge. I think this was super helpful. And I think we're going to have to do this again, maybe on some brain fitness stuff too. So thanks again for joining us today. Just last closing great message. Great job, Jonathan. Thank you. Just last closing message for everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the gift of your attention. And remember, work on what's in your bullseye. Just pick that first thing first and work on the stuff on the outer ring second, but just get started right now. Thanks. All right. You heard the man. Let's get after yeah. it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you uh, in the coming weeks. We appreciate it. Thank you again, Jonathan. Thank you, Thank you very much.